Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you, Lawrence, for the introduction. But what I want to talk to you about now is most of you will know me for the work that I've done um, since I left college, agricultural college, which has been in seeds. But I want to tell you my experience as a farmer because I was really fortunate, and um, my group of people that I work with, we, we, we've been, you know, we've had a degree of success over the years, and it got us to the point where we were able to hopefully now do something with the um, success that we'd built. And so when uh, a while ago an opportunity came up in the Cotswolds to buy a farm, we decided that we would um, take it. And so we bought ourselves a very small farm, relatively speaking. It's a farm that is slightly smaller than average, but it's of, on sufficient scale. It's just over 100 acres, sufficient scale to, to use and tell this story. So Honeydale Farm is, uh, has been a farm uh, for a long time, and I'll just tell you a little bit about it just to set the scene, and I want to describe its ecosystems. It's really important. So um, this is Honeydale Farm on the screen now. It, um, it's contained within the yellow box, so you can see quite clearly it's a beautifully square farm with the farm buildings right in the centre of it, as how many farms were originally. But you'll notice one or two things really quickly. One is that it's um, half of the ground is, uh, is cultivated, the top half effectively, and it does fall down to the river in the bottom where the blue line is, and that's the river Evenload, which goes eventually to 15 million people in the Thames Valley. So anything we do on this farm, anything the farmers do upstream of, of London has an effect on, on people's uh, ecosystems in London. So for me, the ecosystem is about soil, it's about the plants, about the animals, about the water, the, the whole total environment of that farm. And you can see very quickly that it is, you know, it's, it, it affects a lot of different things. So when we went to the farm originally, all that cultivated land I showed you, that was 60 acres of spring barley, and that had been monoculture for decades. And that's a farming system that evolved over many years, as ma many of us have been involved with. But the monoculture system really doesn't offer us much in the way of ecosystem. It offers us virtually nothing, in fact. Uh, at least that was our experience. So we carried on with this system for a while. And here's my wife again, um, actually at this stage looking quite impressed with my abilities. Um, so he may not have read the book, but he did at least get out there and do a bit of farming. And this was our first crop, which was exactly the same as the previous farmer had grown for decades. So we decided not to change anything, but to monitor the farm for 12 months to see what it was all about in, the, in, the, in its present form. We were advised to do this by so many of our good friends. So we grew a fantastic crop of spring barley. It looked really nice. Um, but when you come to the maths, it doesn't stack up. And this is the monetary value that we got from our barley. We grew a really nice crop on the Cotswolds. It was perfect. We got a, a good yield. We sold it with a malting barley premium, which means we got paid more, uh, but it still lost money. Well, we deal with a lot of farmers. I think there's 15,000 farmers at the moment, and most farmers would agree that there's an awful lot of marginal crops like this. You know, and when you're not making any money on a farm, it's really difficult to see how it's sustainable. So we went to basic principles at the farm, we decided we would start with the soil. We, you know, we, with the work we've done, we, we know how important the soil is, we know how important the crops are in relation to the soil, and that, that effectively that will deliver everything else down, down the road. But it's long term, you know, this is not something that we can think about changing overnight. So we decided that we would start with a conventional lay farming system, bearing in mind that this farm was really monoculture spring barley. We completely changed the emphasis to grow our own fertility by using deep rooting grasses, clovers, and herbs. And this is what it looks like uh, it, you know, in terms of the uh, plants that we use. So at least half of our crop rotation, and there is one, is growing these deep rooting plants. And these plants harness natural systems. This, there's nothing new about any of this. This is just reinventing the role for these plants. So the legumes, the flowering legumes, are fixing nitrogen, and they can fix more nitrogen. As, as um, Ellen McCarthy said this morning, you know, 80% of the stuff that goes into urban areas could come out as fertilizer. Great, fantastic, let's do that. But this stuff is already happening. We can make available more nitrogen than we need through plant growth, and we can make available also phosphates. So I don't see why we can't use this natural system. The other thing that I would stress about this particular image is the way in which the plants are arranged. This isn't monoculture where everything is the same. We want massive diversity, not only in the plant species, uh, but within the way in which they grow through the year. So we 
in this case, with a lay farming system, we don't want all our crop to be ripe on the same day, ready for the combine harvester. We want plants to be growing early in the spring. We want them to be growing in the middle of the summer and late in the autumn, so that we're fully utilizing the eternal sunlight that we, you know, so that we can get maximum plant growth. We also, in our case, have sheep on the farm, um, and that makes the uh, picture complete as far as I'm concerned, because crop production in, in isolation doesn't really seem to cut the mustard for me, not in terms of soil fertility. Every farm is different, as I think a number of speakers have said this morning, and I would totally concur with that. But where you have the opportunity to lose livestock in the system, you bring the fertility. Again, there's nothing new about these systems. What you do with the livestock is another question. But my point is, when you follow these animals around, you look at the soil and you look at the environment which they're creating, with insects particularly, you see this huge ecosystem evolving around plants, the livestock, and the things that they bring. This is what our sheep look like. <coughs> we, um, we work with a neighbouring uh, farmer. Uh, we host these sheep. This is his son's sheep. So there's two generations of farmer involved. We, myself and my wife and other people involved on our farm, move these sheep on a daily basis on a mob grazing system. I'm not recommending a mob grazing system to everyone. For us, it works really well because we believe we can build soil fertility more quickly that way. We also grow plants just purely to improve the soil. This is a crop of mustard which is a monoculture mustard. And it's brilliant in some respects. It's a load of green material, very easy to grow, very cheap to grow, and it's ploughed back into the soil. But why do we want to stop there? This is what traditional or modern conventional agriculture has taught us. Just grow one single crop, it's easy, because you can control the weeds in that with the herbicide. But when we grow stuff like this slide shows you... Oops, hang on. I've, I've actually... Forgive me, I've skipped one. Can I just go back one, please? Yeah. So, th so this, is, this is growing oats. Sorry, forgive me. This is growing oats... And with a monoculture oat, which we grow, or we grow the oats, we undersow it with, a, with an intercrop, which is in this case a legume. And this clover is fixing nitrogen whilst the oats are growing. And it's not a particularly difficult technique, it's not a particularly new one, but when it works really well, like this next slide will show you, it is building soil fertility. So there's a huge amount of nitrogen being fixed into the soil, free of charge. This is suppressing weeds. We get very few weeds in our crops when we've got an undersown legume, so we don't need herbicides. That's economically sensible. And the sheep can graze this. So it has multiple, multiple uses. We're still growing the corn crop, is what I'm saying. So going back to the mustard, here's our monoculture mustard, which is what I was taught to do when I was at Agricultural College. Grow mustard, it's a green manure. That's what you do. But mustard in isolation is missing a few tricks. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see that there are... There's loads to be had from growing more species in the same space. Because for green crops particularly that are ploughed back into the soil, it's a very old farming technique, you can use multiple species. You can fix nitrogen. You can add huge amounts of organic matter. You can provide for insects. You can provide for farmland birds. We allow ours to seed for the birds. We put this into rotation so that the birds, this is our bird seed plot. We don't, put, we don't confine our bird seed plots to the outside of the fields. Thanks very much. So our bird numbers in three years have gone from 44 to 77. Sorry, 74. The merlin has come because there are little brown birds to eat. You know, this is a system. This is an ecosystem that works really, really well. We also have plants on our farm that are really well adapted to their environment. This is a plant called sandfoin. The sandfoin plants we have are not uniform. They're part of a, of a land race selection, which has been evolved over many, many years. So these plants are unlike a crop of wheat that has the, exactly the same um, genetic makeup and is expressed the same. These don't. These express themselves differently depending on their environment, which we can harness. It's really, really important longer term. The sandfoin looks like this. It's a fabulous crop. This is the dog in a, a show-stopping crop, uh, which we grew this year. And the next slide shows you that we baled it for hay. We had a thousand, over a 1,000 bales of hay off nine acres. It was the heaviest yielding crop on our farm. Now, I'm not suggesting that sandfoin is the heaviest yielding crop, but it was on our farm. We recognized it, and we grew it specifically because it suited the environment, and it was really useful. It also is fabulous for bees. We have loads of bees on our farm, both wild native bees, bumblebees, and also honeybees. 
And our farm has created not an ecosystem, not just for the farm, uh, the obvious things, but also for people. These are our beekeepers. These are not full time. Our, one of our beekeepers here is a mentor, and the other is a beekeeper who works in my office in the seed business. We also have fruit trees. The bees pollinate the fruit trees, of course. Uh, we've planted a, a living uh, library of Oxfordshire varieties, 250 varieties, which we did with the local community. And we are hoping the local community will come back in 10 years and harvest the fruit. I, <laughs> Richard's laughing. I don't think that's a pipe dream at all. I genuinely believe that's what we're going to achieve because I think they're bought into the system. Oh, sorry. And, and finally, <laughs> no, I know. Sorry, Richard, forgive me. And finally, because I know time, Lawrence, is, is ticking away. Water wasn't on our farm when we arrived. It was going straight down the ditches into the river I showed you at the beginning. So we uh, took a little bit of money from the National Lottery Fund, £7,000, and we created a natural flood management scheme. We have now got, as a result of that, wetland birds on the farm, loads of dragonflies, everybody likes it, including the duck, and this is our farm now. So from that monoculture farm we had right at the beginning, this is how we've ended up. It's a patchwork quilt. I wish it was all more, a little bit more permaculture, I wish it was a little bit more rounded. That's what we've been able to achieve with machinery. There are more crops than I could name, I'd need another 10 minutes, which I won't take, but I believe that is a potential farm of the future that we've created. It's not for everyone, everyone's will be different. But it is doable, we've done that in three years' time, in three years, I should say, and I think it's possible. And so finally, that is my vision. Of course, I have to have a little plug for the seed because that's the beginning of this whole system. Uh, but this ecosystem is very creatable.